Right. Day four, part three, Carly Griggs murder trial. We left off on the last video. The the prosecution and rebuttal had two witnesses, uh, the nurse practitioner, and they also had on her counselor therapist. Um, man. And they're fixing to call a doctor. I stopped it where she said doctor something. I didn't catch her name, but I stopped it right there. So they're gonna they're gonna get her up, and we'll see what her credentials are and all that mess. Um, here in just a moment. But they didn't. The two doctors the prosecution just had on in their rebuttal never knew about Carly's. Carly never mentioned blackouts, never mentioned hearing voices. I still have yet to see a testimony that her stepfather and her mother knew about these things. So, for Carly to come on after the murder, tell the other doctor, I think his name was Andrew Clark, told him all kinds of stuff. She's been hearing voices since she was six, and, and, and she has blackouts, and none of this was revealed to any of these two, uh, the nurse practitioner or the counselor, when they were seeing her. And the nurse, and the, the counselor, therapist lady, uh, Rebecca, I didn't get her last name, but anyway, uh, she had like nine sessions with Carly. Nine sessions, and most of them, they were alone. She even said she felt like she wasn't helping her. And she was considering assigning her or she could get somebody else to help her that she had to try to probe even harder in Carly to get Carly to say things. Then the defense comes out on cross on on the counselor and says, well, Carly was, go was going to. <laughs> like, that's... That kind of was like, okay, so Carly, Carly was going to give you her journal. But what is this what if stuff? I know the defense had asked her a couple of what if questions, which threw me for a loop. Like what, what difference does it make? What if she told you this? What if she told you that? Well, it doesn't make any difference now. Obviously, if she would have told you certain things, well, but, Obviously, it would have made a difference at the time. I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney. And what she was trying to prove by asking her a what if, because me as a spectator watching it, like, why are you asking her these what if questions? What if Carly's mom would have told you this? I, and, and true is like, who cares? She didn't give you her her journal. Apparently, they, they've they never talked about with these two doctors, with, with the nurse practitioner and with the counselor, about the handwriting. Like, her parents did know about it. I think the dad had, had they touched a little bit upon it, about some creepy handwriting that they found. And they had confronted her about it, confronted Carly about it. And Carly had said, I, I don't know. I mean, it was in her room, some creepy handwriting. It's, it says it's not. I didn't do it. I didn't write that. I don't know. <laughs> but they didn't really talk about the journals. They didn't really talk about the handwriting or the drawings uh, with the, the nurse practitioner and the counselor. So, let's see. What would they get out of the counselor? She's gifted. She is good with words. We 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 found out that she's uh, she's a pleaser. We've done that. She's smarter than everybody else. She has anxiety because her friends don't take school as seriously as she does. So these are things that uh, and and she in the last that the counselor saw her uh, in her report. One of the last times she saw her, she was kind of dressed kind of gothy and that she was wearing some, some kind of slacks from her grandma. 
And, and then when when the counselor brought that up, the camera went to Carly, and she flipped her head around and just beamed at her grandparents. It, it was just bizarre. I am good. I've been putting the link in all the descriptions if um, if somebody wants to go back and watch the whole trial. Um, especially day four each of the each of the ones i cover i am putting the link in the description so you could go watch it at your leisure now they're all some of them are eight hours this one says it's nine hours uh they've already had a morning break i skipped through that the jury's already in the room we're fixing to have another doctor i don't know what kind of doctor she is so we haven't established who all knew about the blackouts? This is this is really, really crucial about the blackouts and the voices. And again, if if it's true, and I keep saying it, all the stuff, the crap that the Clark, Doctor Clark said, that she still needs to be put away forever. If she's hearing voices and she's blacking out, uh, she, this is going to happen again. He's he even said. It gets worse as they get older. So I think this defense is back is backing fire in my view that you want to establish that she she's schizophrenic. She has blackouts. Guess what? She doesn't need to walk amongst us. Because it's, it's she's so young right now, and this is gonna get worse. And that is a fact in the psychiatric uh, world that these people get worse as they get older. So I think this this uh, this defense that they're having for her, which they know she's guilty, they're just trying to minimize her sentence. Um, and that, guys, that she probably should have took the plea deal. They probably should have said, this is a, this is going to be a stretch. The, and the defense knew they had this video. They've not seen this video. They're like, yeah, we urge you to take this defense. Because you're going to be found guilty. We're going to say, I mean, I'm not an attorney, but I'm just thinking common sense. That you're going to sit here and tell the jury, tell the world, She's blacking out. She hears voices. What kind of sentence do you think? We're going to take our chance with a jury to give you less time? 20 years and she's 14 in the big scheme of things is probably a, just a drop in the bucket. It, it's saying she would get uh, paroled after, uh, what is it? Uh, well, when would she get paroled? After, after, well, she'd get 40 years. I'm sorry. She'd get 40 years and she'd be patrol, patrolled, paroled after 20. And even then with good behavior, she probably could have got out before then. You know how they do. They always letting these crazy people out. But anyway, I think it was a bad move for them to do that but you know maybe in the big scheme of things it was the best because uh she should not be walking amongst us uh that's where we are let's jump into this i don't want to make this too long it's already kind of a long opening but just a little quick rundown of what has been happening all right here we go the prosecution is still on rebuttal and has called another doctor up. Yes, sir. Do you understand you're now under oath and your answers will be sworn answers under penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. All right, you may proceed. Can you please get your name for the record? Amanda Gugliano, G U G L I A N O. And Dr. Gugliano, where are you currently employed? 
I currently work at Mississippi State Hospital, and I also have a private practice where I do forensic psychological evaluations. Uh, and if you could tell us just a little bit about what it is you do out at the Mississippi State Hospital. I am the director of the Forensic Evaluation Service. So we are the only forensic service for the entire state. We do some outpatient evaluations, but now things have changed. It's mostly inpatient evaluations. And then, so we do inpatient evaluations for the court regarding competence to stand trial, someone's mental state at the time of the alleged offense, and sometimes some other factors too, such as mitigating circumstances or a violence risk assessment. Then we also provide treatment for individuals who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity, and we provide treatment for people who have been found incompetent to stand trial, and we're attempting to restore them to competence. Uh, and you talked uh, about the fact that you, <coughs> excuse me, are a forensic psychologist that do, uh, you also perform private evaluations or do something on the side. Can you talk about that, please? Yes, I have a private practice where I conduct forensic evaluations for both the state and the federal court. And those are typically related to the similar issues as I do for the state hospital, competence to stand trial, mental state at the time of the alleged offense. Um, I have also done some death penalty evaluations if someone's competent to waive or assert post-conviction appeals or competence to um, proceed with post-conviction appeals also. And when you're doing these evaluations, who are you usually doing those on behalf of? It's tip, most often it's court ordered. So it's in my opinion, when something's court order, I consider that as the court's expert. Um, my report goes to the court and then both sides usually get a copy of it. Sometimes I am retained privately by one side, either the defense or the prosecution, and then I'm conducting the evaluation for them. So the person that I'm actually seeing and evaluating is not my client. It's the court or whichever attorney retained me. And so if they're not your client, you're not actually providing them any type of treatment, right? That's correct. Uh, could you give the ladies and gentlemen a little bit of information about your educational background? <clears throat> I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology from Lindenwood University, which is a private liberal arts school in Missouri. I received my Master's in Clinical Psychology from the Arizona School of Professional Psychology in 2006, and I received my doctorate in clinical psychology from the Arizona School of Professional Psychology in 2008. And do you have any type of licensure or certifications here in Mississippi? Yes, I'm a licensed psychologist in Mississippi, and then I'm also certified as a forensic evaluator by the Department of Mental Health. Tell us a little bit about what that means, um, a, a evaluator through the Mississippi Department of Mental Health. Yes, so the Department of Mental Health has a process where they train and credential psychologists or psychiatrists and psychiatrists to be forensic evaluators. So they are credentialed to do evaluations of competence to stand trial or mental state at the time of the alleged offense. Do you know how many of them are approved uh, in the state currently? I'm not sure our current numbers. There are some that are approved who don't reside in Mississippi. They do telehealth evaluations. I think we have around 20 right now maybe, but not all of them reside in Mississippi. And so that's 20 psychologists and psychiatrists that are, uh, have meet the qualifications for the mental department of health to do the evaluations? Yes, that meet the qualifications and have applied to do those. Do you, have, uh, do you belong to any sort of um, 
national or state level committees, uh, any type of groups regarding psychologists? Yes, I'm a member of the American Psychological Association. I'm also a member of the American Psychology and Law Society, which focuses on forensic psychology. I am a member of the Mississippi Psychological Association, and I'm also the president-elect for the Mississippi Psychological Association. And I know we talked about the fact that you perform these types of evaluations for both, uh, mostly, most of the time for the court, but also sometimes for the party that asks. Uh, how many times would you say that you have evaluated someone either for competency or sanity? For competency, probably around 1,500 times. Uh, for sanity, probably around 500 times. And have you testified in courts uh, as an expert, as a forensic psychologist previously? Yes, I have. Uh, and how often would you say you've done that? Probably about, I don't know exactly, about 45 times. Uh, and you've actually oh, so I'm thinking she is going to say, Carly is not insane. I'm just guessing. And she is competent to stand trial. Now, I didn't get it on film, but like I said, I'm going to put the link in the description. When they were waiting for the jury to come in and, and the camera came back on after their break, Carly was holding up a clipboard. I think it was some drawings. And she was showing it to her grandparents. And they were like, you know, it was just weird. So she's been sketching and, and she's showing her drawings to her grandparents. It's just bizarre, by the way. It's just a little tidbit of information if you want to go back and watch it. It's, um, what are we, 228? So it's uh, within the last six. Before she got on, it was just a few minutes. So if you want to mark down that timestamp uh, looking on the screen of uh, the court, the two... Uh, this number right here so it's going to be a few minutes before that if you want to go and fast forward and see that because it was weird as usual but anyway i'm thinking this is what this lady's on here for guys is to say she's not insane i don't know let's find out actually been recognized by this particular court as a forensic psychologist expert right yes i have uh, Your Honor, at this time, we would ask that the witness be tendered as an expert witness in forensic psychology. No objection, Your Honor. I believe her CV has already been entered by stipulation. All right, she'll be accepted as an expert in the field of forensic psychology. Dr. Gugliano, if you could tell the ladies and gentlemen the difference in like a treating physician or therapist and a forensic psychologist. So it's a pretty different situation. I mentioned before, whenever you are treating someone, whenever you're the clinician, either a psychiatrist or psychologist, therapist, you're more of an advocate for the client, the person that you're treating. And you are treating and assessing them based on what they're telling you usually for the most part. A lot of times treating clinicians don't have much information or records outside of what the client tells them. So they just go off of what they see in front of them and what the client tells them. In doing yeah. forensic evaluations, the person that you're actually evaluating and talking to and assessing is not your client. As I mentioned before, it's the court or potentially a lawyer. Um, it could also be one of it could be one of the parents if there's like a child custody dispute and you're doing that type of evaluation but typically it's the lawyer or the court and in that case you are not an advocate for the person that you're evaluating you are supposed to be a neutral objective evaluator who forms opinions based on the information that you have and you offer those to the court so there's no guarantee that it will be helpful or not to either side or to the court. It also, when you're a forensic evaluator, it's not confidential because you have to share the information that you gather with the court in a report or you may end up testifying. I always warn people of that also. So it's also different in that 
um, doing a forensic evaluation because there's legal issues involved you rely on more than just the person's self-report. It's really important to have collateral sources of information. So you are always trying, trying to corroborate what someone tells you to see if there's evidence in the records to support what they're telling you. Do you, you other people say the same thing? You often interview friends or family, maybe even an employer of the person that you're evaluating. So it's not as um, clear that you're just taking what the person tells you as the truth. You're wanting to look for corroborating evidence and find where okay. all the data is kind of pointing you. What direction is it all suggesting? And you spoke earlier, Dr. Guglielmo, about confidence and maybe somebody's sanity. If you could kind of describe for us what competency is first. Competency in general can be applied to various different things. It's situation specific. And what it essentially means is that someone has the ability to do something. So it could be competence to make legal decisions or competence to be over your own um, medical care, financial situation, things like that. In the realm of criminal cases, competence is typically referred to for competence to stand trial or to proceed with their legal situation. And so that means does the person have the ability to understand their charges to understand the basics about the court system and how that works to be able to appreciate the adversarial nature of the legal system and that they're able to assist their attorney in their defense. Who made the decision for her to not take the plea deal? If she's comp if she's not competent, if she's insane or because she was in jail and she's taking her medicine. And remember the good doctor said, Dr. Clark, the voices had stopped since she got on this other medicine. Uh, so she didn't take the plea deal. And so obviously she's competent. If she's being tried as an adult, she made the final decision, right? I'm thinking. All right, so they're evaluating her and in, in all of this. Okay, just I was, I just wanted to throw that out there where she said that that they want to make sure in legal cases and all of this stuff does she understand the severity of making decisions? Okay. So competence really has to do with someone's mental functioning presently in the current moment. Sanity or mental state at the time of an alleged offense has to do with how someone was doing mentally at the time of an offense sometime in the past. So it's a retrospective evaluation where you're looking at, you're trying to figure out whether someone was so mentally ill that it impaired their ability to know the nature, quality, or wrongfulness of their alleged acts. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Is there a certain standard in the state of Mississippi that forensic psychiatrists and psychologists have to follow when rendering opinions about sanity? Yes. Oh, could you tell the ladies and gentlemen about that? I think you sort of described yes. that. I just want you to talk a little bit more about that. Yes, the standards is what we often call the McNaughton standard because that's the uh, criminal case that the standard developed out of. It, the person who was the defendant was Daniel McNaughton. And so the McNaughton standard is what we refer to as a cognitive test. That means that it's just based on someone's knowledge about something. So it's do they know the nature and quality? That essentially means do they understand the basic facts about what they did? Um, then understanding the wrongfulness is did they understand that what they were doing was illegal 
So some states have different standards. Um, so some states include whether someone had the ability to control their impulses or whether they appreciated the wrongfulness. But in Mississippi, it's just a knowledge of what they were doing and if it was wrong. So I want to be clear, you said something about other states allow whether somebody appreciated um, what, they, what they did was right or wrong. Can you describe for us what you meant by that? Yes. So knowledge is really just understanding the basic facts about something. Appreciating is having a more in-depth understanding to where you can understand the societal and moral implications behind it and reasoning for it. So for example, someone might know that killing someone is wrong, that it's illegal, but they may not really understand why it's wrong to do that. They know that it's bad, they know they're not supposed to, but they really don't understand why. So that would be more the appreciation where they don't understand the reasoning behind why it's wrong. And Mississippi doesn't allow us to talk about the appreciation of someone, right? It doesn't include that in the standard. I want to talk to you about uh, wow. the defendant, Carly Gregg. How is it that you became, or were, did you have the opportunity to work on an evaluation involving Carly Gregg? I did. And how is it that you became involved in that case? You contacted me to see if I would be available to do an evaluation of Ms. Gregg's competence to stand trial and sanity. Um, and was it your understanding that you were being court ordered for that? It was. Um, and is that how you went about your evaluation? Yes, it is. Uh, and in fact, we, we talked a little bit about how that's different, but when somebody's, when you're court ordered to do it, you said you return, you return that report to the court and the defense attorneys, right? Yes. Actually, in Mississippi, I submit my report to the circuit clerk, and then the circuit clerk distributes it to the judge, defense attorney, and prosecution. Does the prosecution have any ability to edit the report that you prepare? No. Uh, does the prosecution actually really have any input into what you put into your report? No. Uh, and sometimes those reports actually come back and say that the defendant is incompetent to, for, uh, to go forward, right? Correct. And sometimes you will render an opinion that the defendant is in fact insane. Correct. I want to talk to you about this particular case, Dr. Guglielmo. Did you prepare a report uh, regarding your findings? I did. Uh, and are the opinions that you formulated in that report are those based upon a reasonable degree of medical certainty? To a reasonable degree of psychological certainty, because I'm not a medical doctor, so we use psychological certainty for psychologists. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Uh, and what types of items did you review uh, before rendering your opinion in this case? I reviewed the some court orders involving this case. I reviewed some of the discovery materials. I also had some treatment records, uh, not all of the ones that have been talked about so far by other experts. I had the Magnolia counseling records, so Ms. Kirk's records from the therapy. I also had precise clinical neurosciences records from the medication that she was being prescribed. I had a few records from the jail from her current incarceration related to some crisis contacts, but I did not have any records regarding the medication that she was being prescribed in jail. Then I also spoke with Ms. Newman about her concerns regarding the case, and I spoke to Ms. Todd, the defense attorney, about any concerns she had regarding the case. Um, did you interview anybody besides the defendant in this case? Um, no, I attempted to interview her stepfather, but he had asked to have his attorney present, which I said was okay, and he was going to call me back where we could set up a time to do that, but he never returned my call. What? 
Why wow. is it important to try to talk to family members uh, before you conduct your evaluation? I do that because I'm trying to see if there's anything that they say that I should, that will give me an idea of what to follow up on, or there may be something that isn't in the records that they're aware of. And sometimes they can give you a direction to go with your questioning. I do a pretty broad evaluation, but if there are any significant concerns or specific concerns, I wanna make sure that I know about them so I can ask about them when I interview the defendant. And Dr. Gagliano, you just testified about some of the things that you uh, reviewed, um, that you had conversations with both my office and the defense. Um, are, are those, is that information, facts and data that you typically rely on in conducting uh, your mental health evaluations? Yes, it is. And is that information that is pretty regular for a forensic psychologist to consider when forming their opinions with regards to competency or sanity? Yes. Um, did you actually have the opportunity to speak with Ms. Gregg? Yes, I did. Uh, was that interview recorded? It was. Nice. And do you record all your interviews? I record most of them. There's nice. a few times that I haven't for the federal courts because the attorneys have not wanted me to. And why is it that you record those interviews? I record them in case I need to refer back to my notes. I take notes while I'm interviewing someone, but I like to be as accurate as possible. And I really think that quotes are helpful for either a court or a jury, for either the judge or the jury, whoever's making the decision to see what people actually say. So I record it for my benefit, and then I also record it in case someone wants to get the recording so they can listen to it. I try to have transparency in my evaluations. I'm not trying to do anything that um, I wouldn't want recorded. So it's to help just confirm what I'm reporting in my report. Ooh, I hope they play some of it, guys. <coughs> This is what I was saying in the other videos is why didn't Dr. Clark video him evaluating Carly? He was with her for four hours. And why would the stepdad call her back? This would be crucial for Carly to be, if this woman is evaluating Carly to see if she is competent or if she's insane, to stand trial, know the severity of what she's done, blah, blah, blah. Why wouldn't a stepdad do this? I don't understand. If he wants her, it's attorney present. She's like, fine. And he still didn't call her back? Wow. That's curious. Why? I, I want to know why. Okay. Let's, I hope they play some videos. <laughs> we need more videos. When you're uh, conducting one of these evaluations, Dr. Gugliano, is it your role to favor one side or the other? No, as a forensic evaluator, your goal is to be as objective and unbiased and neutral as possible. That's awesome. How often when you're doing these evaluations do you actually have mental health records from the day before a crime was committed? Very rarely. And how often do you get the opportunity to have a video where part of the crime is committed on the video to consider? Rare. Not, it's not unheard of, but it's not in the majority of cases. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about the interview that you did at the defendant. Who was present during that evaluation? It was myself, Miss Greg, and Miss Todd. And is it common in, in your practice for attorneys to be present during the evaluation? I wouldn't say that it's uncommon. It's not, it doesn't happen in the majority of cases, um, but it's not unusual. How often, uh, when you have attorneys sit in, uh, is it common for them to make comments during the evaluation? Ooh. Most attorneys don't say much during the evaluation uh, unless the defendant asks them a question. I always let both the defendant and the attorney know at the beginning that 
if the defendant wants to consult with their attorney during the evaluation, we can stop and they can consult in private or the defendant can even ask their attorney for guidance at any point without us also stopping the interview. So it happens, but most of the time when it happens, um, it's the defendant who initiates the consult with the attorney in the moment. And in your uh, training and experience and all the evaluations that you perform, uh, is it unusual for an attorney to be asking their client multiple questions uh, instead of you during an evaluation? Yes, I would say that's unusual. Dr. Grigliano, I want to talk to you um, about the specific findings in your evaluation. Can you tell us um, when you conducted that evaluation and sort of walk us through what happened? Ooh. We met in a room at the detention center and it was for several hours. I think we were probably meeting for about five hours, but we had several brief breaks in that time to where the interview was a little over four hours and we had a break for lunch also. Um, but essentially it is it was me asking the majority of the questions to Miss Greg and Miss Todd interjected at some points, but that was pretty much it. Um, were there things that Miss Todd shared with you um, that were not provided to you in discovery? Yes. Uh, is that typical in cases uh, when you have evaluations? Uh, it's not unheard of. Miss Todd shared some things with me on the phone. I talked to her before I met with Miss Greg to do the interview. So she had shared some things with me in the phone on the phone that I was not aware of at that point. And that's one of the reasons that I call attorneys is to see if they have any information that may be helpful. And when they give you that information, you then try to follow up, get some sort of uh, confirmation about those statements or what that information was? Yes. What, if anything, uh, did Ms. Gregg tell you during your evaluation about uh, the use of illegal drugs? She told me that she was smoking marijuana through a vape pen and she denied any other illicit or illegal substance use. Guys, this lady hasn't even looked at her notes yet. This is, this lady is smart. And all the other, the, the, all the other doctors, all three of them, the, the counselor, the pr nurse practitioner, Dr. Clark, all of them look at notes. No, so far, she hasn't looked at no notes. And she, what you think she go? Oh, I need to refresh my memory. Let me see my notes on what drugs Carly told me she took and didn't take. Damn, just wanted to point that out. That like, so far she hasn't looked at any notes. And what is up with her giving her information that wasn't even in disclosure yet? Wow, wow, what what juiciness is going to come from that? In discovery, rather, not disclosure, my bad. In discovery, she didn't even know. Oh, let me tell you this. Well, is it obscuring her to obscure her opinion? I don't know. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, what did she tell you um, about abusing any other prescription medication? Uh, she didn't answer that question. Um, and was that important to you? It's a regular question that I ask when doing an evaluation, both illegal drugs and pre prescription drugs or even over-the-counter um, medications or can have impacts on someone's mental health or in their functioning. So I routinely ask those questions. Uh, and if someone were to have been on a prescription drug at the time of the crime, it would have been important for you to be able to explore that a little bit further, right? 
I would definitely want to know if they were on medications at the time or if they were taking anything yeah. that wasn't prescribed to them. Of course. And if so somebody wasn't truthful or didn't provide you an answer about that, that would impair your ability to make a decision about anything regarding medication. Is that correct? It might not impair my ability. I'm limited in what I can say about medications. I don't prescribe medications. Um, so I'm limited in what I can say about that, but it could limit things such as, you know, it might be a consideration that someone's actions, feelings, behaviors could have potentially been due to a drug or medication. And so if you don't know that they were using that, then you wouldn't know that that's a potential factor. Good point. I want to back up just a little bit. Uh, the defendant uh, told you that she'd been using marijuana um, you have the opportunity to review uh, prior medical records in this case. Did you see anywhere in her prior records where she had reported the use of marijuana? I believe she had reported it to the jail maybe after she was arrested. Prior to March 19th of 2024, had she told any of her treaters that she was using marijuana? From the records that I reviewed, she had not. Um, from the records that you reviewed prior to March the 19th, 2024, had she ever reported to anyone that she was having uh, voices in her head? No, she did not. Prior to March 19th of 2024, in the records you reviewed, had she reported to anyone um, that she was having lapses in time? She did not. Um, and did you find anything that was provided to you by either side to corroborate that Miss Gregg was having lapses in time. Miss Todd told me during our telephone conversation that Miss Gregg's stepfather had mentioned that uh, Miss Gregg was having lapses in time and kind of spacing out. And so I asked Miss Gregg about that during my interview of her. But you weren't able to corroborate that with him. No, I wasn't able to speak with Mr. Smiley. I want to talk to you about the use of, of marijuana. Um, <clears throat> Do y'all recall at any time during Mr. Smiley's uh, testimony that he mentioned her having lapses in time? But Mr. Smiley told the, the attorney this and the attorney told this woman this? I, did I miss something? Because, okay, just wanted to point that out. Like, what? I wonder if the jury's like going, what? In your experience, can the use of drugs alone cause some sort of psychosis? It can. Um, and what about marijuana or THC alone? It can. We actually... it. We didn't, we thought previously there was a common um, belief that marijuana was fairly, fairly benign, but there are higher levels of THC in most marijuana now, or a lot of marijuana now. And so with the more potent marijuana, it is possible that people can experience symptoms of psychosis just from marijuana use. Okay. So I wanted to know, and I had asked this question on one of these, I've done a lot of the, these videos on this trial, that my question was, did I miss her toxicology report? I, I'm assuming that they took, maybe I missed something. I don't know. Maybe it'll come out. Uh, let me know. Did What were her THC levels? Now, Dr. Clark said that Carly said she didn't smoke pot that day, the day of the thing. But I know THC can stay in your system for 30 days, but dead blame. Did she have some illegal pins? A THC with, with uh, the, 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 the vape pens that had high concentrations of THC? I don't know. Uh, I'm just asking questions here. It's like, 
Okay, so you're alluding to the fact that THC can cause delusions or something if it has high THC in it, but she didn't smoke that day. And what was her toxicology on the, if they took her blood that day to, to see if uh, what she had in her system? When we're talking about symptoms of psychosis, can you describe for us what you mean by that? That could be hallucinations, such as seeing things or hearing things that aren't really there and that other people don't see. It could be delusional beliefs, which are beliefs that are untrue, but the person <laughs> staunchly believes that regardless of the facts or evidence presented to them that dispute those beliefs. It could also be mood symptoms like an emotional flattening to where they don't seem to have the normal range of emotions that most people experience. It could even be slowed thinking or slowed body movements. During your interview with Ms. Gregg, um, did you talk to her about some things that might have been bothering her at the current time? Yes, I did. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, may I refer to my Absolutely. Report? I always ask people that I'm evaluating, if you had to pick the one thing that was bothering you the most lately, what would that be? Because I, it's a pretty open-ended question and it can kind of give you a good idea of what is, you know, on that person's mind maybe the most. And Miss Gregg reported that she was bothered that she knew school was getting ready to start up or it just started back and she missed school because she said she really enjoyed school and that had been a main focus of her life. She also discussed feelings of sadness, difficulty sleeping, um, she reported having mood swings. What did she say about her mood swings? She said that they could occur minute by minute or could happen over the course of weeks or days or months. Um, she said, you know, when I asked her to provide some additional clarification, she said, quote, I'll be really happy one minute, then I'll be desolate the next. Close quote. So she was describing, it seemed to me, pretty quickly fluctuating mood states that appeared at least somewhat dependent on her situation and what was going on with her in her life. Dr. Grigliano, you were in the courtroom uh, during the testimony earlier where somebody had mentioned that uh, Ms. Gregg's father potentially had bipolar disorder. Um, can you describe for the ladies and gentlemen what bipolar uh, disorder, I think it's type 2, is? Yes, there's two different types. I'm not sure which one Mr. Gregg has been diagnosed with. Type 1 involves episodes of mania, which you guys had heard about previously. It's whenever someone has the really high emotional experiences, they have a lot of energy, they may feel like they're on top of the world, really happy, feel invincible, um, have trouble focusing. They may start a whole bunch of tasks but never finish anything. Um, they can be more irritable. And it's so severe that it impairs their everyday functioning. Then bipolar 2 disorder is kind of a less extreme version of mania that we refer to as hypomania, where it's they're elevated more than what is normal, but it's not quite to what we consider a manic episode. And when you're talking about a hypomanic or an episode in bipolar, um, is that consistent with somebody whose mood can change minute to minute? No. Uh, could you describe for us why not? Yes. For Bipolar disorder, it's something that isn't based on someone's situation. They really have no control over their emotions. It's not due to something good happening in their life or something bad that's happened in their life. 
And for a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, they have to experience either the manic episode for one week, where for every day, more days than not, that they're in this hyper aroused state. For hypomania, they have to experience it for at least four days in a row. And so that's not something where you would see fluctuations within the same day or hours. Uh, in your evaluation with Carly uh, and your review of the medical records, uh, was it ever disclosed that she had these periods of time that were four days or more? She didn't specify an exact number of days. Um, as I mentioned before, she said, you know, it could be hours, days, weeks. You spoke with Ms. Gregg about mood swings, um, and then she described for you at some point during your interview, um, I'm very detached, um, and I think you asked her to elaborate on that. Do you recall what Ms. Gregg told you regarding being, feeling det detached? Yes, so I was asking her questions that can sometimes be commonly found in people who have experienced traumatic experiences. So symptoms that sometimes indicate someone may have post-traumatic stress disorder. And we were talking about anxiety also and she looked at her notes okay how she didn't feel just now as bothered as she thought she should have felt by being in jail and so I was asking her more about that and Miss Todd offered that Miss Greg appeared to be detached and that Miss Todd thought that might have been due to Miss Greg being in solitary confinement she'd been housed by herself in the jail since she's a minor so she has little interaction with other people other than the guards when they interact with her and so I asked Carly about that and she said I'm very detached um, and she said and when I asked her to describe that a little further she he said quote I think when my mom would get on me I would kind of slip away and not be in the room I just kind of feel like it wasn't real. I think that's how I am now because all this doesn't feel real. I mean, logically it is, it just doesn't feel that way." Close quote. Um, and then you went on, Dr. Gugliano, to ask her about blackouts. Can you tell ladies and gentlemen uh, what y'all's conversation about blackouts was? Yes. For reference, I think that's on the same page we were just looking at, same paragraph. Okay. I had asked her if she ever experienced a blackout, and she said that's kind of what happened with the incident, the alleged offense. She discussed further about the blackout, saying that she would just kind of space out, and I believe she said in particular whenever, like if her mom was yelling at her, she was in trouble with her mom or something like that. Did she ever use the words derealized? She did not. Uh, what about the word disassociation or disassociated? No, she did not use those words. Um, did she reveal to you that she was having intrusive memories uh, regarding the crimes committed in this case? Yes, she did. Could you tell ladies and gentlemen about that? Yes, so intrusive memories are just memories that someone is doing something else they're not purposefully thinking about something and the memories just pop into their head and once they get in their head and once they're thinking about them it's really hard to stop thinking about them it's hard to let go of those memories and so i don't think at that point that i asked her for details about the intrusive memories regarding the offenses because I had not yet determined whether she was competent to stand trial and talking about that could have potentially revealed incriminating information so I was waiting until later to ask that and we never ended up circling back to that. 
And Dr. Giuliani, in your, uh, was there anything about your conversation where somebody said something about feeling queasy when they were thinking about the event? Yes. Um, tell me about that, if you would. Carly reported that sometimes when she thought about the alleged offenses that she would feel queasy. And what else did she say about being paranoid? She described having thoughts that bad things were going to happen, such as that someone would jump on her in the jail or things like that. And in my experience and opinion, that's more consistent with anxiety than uh, delusional paranoia. Whenever people kind of have those thoughts where they just worry about all these things that could potentially happen, that is symptomatic. You know, they often say that I'm paranoid that these things are going to happen, but they're not using it in the clinical sense of paranoia, and it's not what I would think of in the clinical sense as paranoia, as like psychotic paranoia. I want to okay. take a step back, Dr. Guzano. The word queasy, and, and you talked about that she, Carly said she felt queasy when thinking about the event. Um, can, you, can you elaborate on what that meant? She, she's saying she's queasy when she thinks about the event, so that means that she remembered the event? I thought she blacked out. If you black out, how can you remember the event? But now she's feeling queasy. This this could get interesting. I didn't ask her, but I was assuming that it meant sick to her stomach. About the crimes that have been committed? About something in relation to them. I didn't ask for any specifics. Why did you not uh, ask? At some point, Dr. Viliano, did you have a discussion with Carly about whether or not she was hearing voices? Yes, I did. Um, and what did she say about the voices? She said that she had been hearing one voice, a male voice, since she was young. I think she said maybe around like five or six years old, which is unusual. And she said that she heard the voice every day and that it was always kind of there in the background, but she could usually ignore it and tune it out. You said that it was unusual that somebody would start hearing a voice at five or six. Can you tell us why? Yeah, that's not really consistent with a psychotic disorder. Typically, people start having symptoms of psychosis for women in their early to mid-20s. For men, it's late teens, early 20s. Um, it's very unusual for a child, a young child, to have what are actually hallucinations. And it's possible that it wasn't what we would clinically consider a hallucination. It could be, you know, as a kid, it could be something like their own inner thoughts or their inner dialogue, and they don't recognize that as what that is. Um, she described those voices that she was hearing them every single day? Yes. Uh, is that common in people in that age group? No. Um, what did she say about uh, whether or not these voices ever told her to do anything? She said the voices never told her to do anything. She said that they made snide comments about other people and just really rude comments, kind of talking down about other people. Um, I specifically asked her if the voices ever told her or said anything about her mom or her stepdad and she said no. Um, you were present in the courtroom yesterday during Dr. Clark's testimony, right? Yes. And you heard mention that Carly had disclosed to uh, an employee at, through Vital Court that in fact her mom, she heard voices that told her to harm her mom. Yes, that's what Dr. Clark said. Uh, so there's records saying Carly said the voices told me to hurt mom, but that's not what she reported to you. Correct. Wow. So she's not consistent.
Wow. Dr. Pigliano, as part of your evaluation uh, regarding competency, one of the things you consider is the defendant's ability to recall facts. Um, could you tell the ladies and gentlemen why that's important? That is a requirement specifically for Mississippi. Most other states don't have that as part of their competence to stand trial requirement. There's not a clear definition of what um, is specifically meant by that in the standard. The general interpretation that I have for it is that it means that someone can recall basic information about their case. If they have a discussion with their attorney, are they able to remember what they talked about? Um, what do they remember about the alleged offenses? If they don't have a good memory or don't remember the alleged offenses, are they able to go over the evidence and remember the evidence enough to be able to help their attorney prepare their defense? And in this case, did you, uh, what did you find regarding Ms. Gregg's ability to remember relevant facts about the alleged offense? It was my opinion that she had the ability to recall relevant facts. We talked about the month leading up to the alleged offenses and what all was going on with her then. And her report was fairly consistent with the records that I had available. She also did not demonstrate any current memory deficits that would have been concerning. So I didn't talk to her about that day in particular because I didn't end up evaluating her sanity at the time of the alleged offense. So I don't know exactly what all she recalls from that particular day. No, oh, come on. With regards to your evaluation, did you in fact uh, find a forensic opinion regarding Carly, excuse me, ability to proceed to trial and competency? Yes, it was my opinion that she had the ability to do so. And is that to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty? It is. And again, just to kind of go through those factors with us, the ability to understand the nature and the proceedings against her. Yes. Um, and then what else is that? The ability to rationally communicate with her attorney about her case, the ability to recall relevant facts, and the ability to testify in her own defense if she chose to do so. Uh, and in fact, you found that Carly was competent. That was my opinion. I don't decide that. Uh, that's up to the court to decide. And in this particular case, Dr. Gugliano, um, did you send your report to the clerk's office like you do when you're court ordered to perform an evaluation? I did. No further questions, Your Honor. Wow. Well, they were, I wanted to see video. <laughs> Maybe it's just not relevant in the court. I don't know, but I would have liked to have seen them talking to her. <clears throat> Why wouldn't she ask her questions about the day of the event? If she's trying to, because she, she said she didn't ask her that because of it could incriminate her. But her lawyer was sitting right there. I don't know. I don't understand that part of it. But, I mean, I kind of do. But if she's innocent and she blacked out, right? She's in it. She blacked out. She didn't know what she was doing. So why couldn't she, her, with her sitting there with her attorney talking to this lady, say, well, I just don't remember because I blacked out. She didn't ask her anything about it, but apparently Carly could recall things that, that happened a month out. She established that, in her opinion, that Carly was able to stand trial and even testify in her own defense. So the court appointed her. She's supposed to be unbiased, at what which her report... Even though the, the prosecution reached out to her, it's not her position to go one way or the other. She She's just going to do this, whether it's going to help the prosecution or help the defense. She's just going to do it, which that that's good. 
So she tells her her concerns were, and what was she feeling when she was t asking her questions about how she was feeling prior to this and all that. Oh, she's feeling like she's sad and she's missing school. She's looking forward to getting back to school. The that's kind of conflicting with, okay, you're excited to get back to school. Okay, that's that's a good feeling, right? But she has sadness. She has problems sleeping, which we've all heard a whole bunch of that. She has mood swings. And her mood swings could change minute by minute. Well, I'm assuming, okay, she's a girl. She's a young girl going through puberty. We all know she's going to have mood swings. Even grown women have mood swings. So, yeah, that that's there. Her feeling detached when her mom yelled at her. She, she left her body. She went somewhere else like, like the doctor said. If, if somebody's in a being abused... They kind of detach themselves because it's really a heinous thing happening. Okay. That's, boom, that's out there. But her mom fussing at her, she becomes detached. There has been no evidence that her mother abused her. And fussing at her, getting onto her, is not abuse. That's just good parenting, in my opinion intrusive memories they didn't even go over it with her she didn't want to bring it up again because of the the not wanting to talk about the the incident of the day that she did she have intrusive thoughts that day well, i didn't hear the the dr clark mention any intrusive thoughts for that day that she just woke up in a bad mood she was grumpy she was grumpy. Okay, so then they talked about uh, pot can cause uh, delusions. I get if it's really super high THC. I want to know what the toxicology was on her if they took it because she claimed she told Doctor Clark she did she didn't smoke no pot that morning, that day. So she she had been in school all day. She is not. Now, I know THC can stay in your system for a long time, but she didn't smoke any that day. So I don't think they can use that because they're trying to establish that she's on medication. She has smoked pot. She she blacks out. She's hearing voices. All of this, all of this stuff. This is going to conclude part three of day four. So the next video, we're going to see the, the defense get up and cross this witness.